Oh, hi, Mark. I'm, hi, I'm Pete McMurray, and this is Mark Stoltzenberg, and um, uh, I'm interviewing Mark about his uh, work in aerosol science. And um, Mark, this is a, a good occasion, a great occasion. Yesterday you received the <clears throat> Benjamin Y.H. Liu Award for your outstanding work on the development of in aerosol instrumentation, and that, of course, is going to be the focus of our discussion today. Uh, so it's it's just a perfect time to, to think about your career and your, your contributions. Um, before we get into the details of your work on aerosol and aerosol science and instrumentation, um, I'm curious to know how you got here. What was your background? What attracted you to uh, begin your work in aerosol science? Well, Peter, um, I... In high school, I had already made up my mind that I, I really loved physics and math. And uh, so, so I went to college with that as a firm decision. And uh, what happened was uh, I, I loaded up my last two years with all physics and math classes and it sort of burned me out. Uh, also, at the same time, uh, I found out that all my intuition about physics did me no good when it came to quantum physics. Uh, so uh, I was faced with uh, trying to revamp my plans uh, to some degree. I, I looked at graduate school in physics, uh, but it had to be classical physics. And uh, I just wasn't finding anything out there. And what I really realized I wanted was applied classical physics, something like that. And uh, at the time, I was working as a, uh, a lab tech for my brother in water chemistry at the University of Madison. And his advisor, Anders Andern, knew about the, the particle technology laboratory up in Minnesota and, and Ken Whitby in particular. And uh, I, I got the phone number and I talked to Ken Whitby, I think it was less than five minutes on the phone and, and he had assured me there was a place for me up at the Particle Tech Lab. Uh, there was money to support me and uh, come on up. <laughs> and then when I got here, it was in the middle of a field study. So I think three days in a row I walked in the office, is Professor Whitby here? <laughs> no, no, he's not. And I, I think by the third or the fourth day the, the secretary said, well, just what is it you want, et cetera, et cetera. And I found myself getting up at 5 o'clock the next morning to, to be on the field study. That, <laughs> that was my first week at the particle lab. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, um, and, and you're a natural morning person, right? So that... That fit right. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, maybe from the other end. <laughs> it's interesting. Your, your uh, introduction to aerosol science is not so different from mine. I met Sheldon Friedlander uh, shortly <clears throat> after I arrived at Caltech, and immediately I was also a physics student and was looking for um, an area that would fit my talents and interests, and immediately uh, upon meeting Sheldon, I knew that this was an area that would suit my talents and interests, and, and it has been. I've, I've never looked back. So, um, um, so you, you arrived at Minnesota, and, um, and in fact, you arrived in 1978, as I recall. That's right. And my first year was 1977, so you were a beginning graduate student, and I was in a beginning assistant professor at the time, and we began to work together because we were both working um, to support Ken Whitby's field measurements. And we participated in a number of field studies. I remember we were in uh, Arizona, and uh, I believe you were in Ohio. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. did you get down to Tennessee and Alabama? That, that I yeah. managed to miss. Oh, you missed that. that was a <laughs> I, I was so encouraged. Oh, no, you, you should come along. And I'm going, I, I just got here for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> In, in any event, um, uh, you spent a lot of time working on field study. It was a challenge to keep all of the equipment going. They were in the back of the van. When there was a lot of vibration as we moved around. Instruments failed. 
Do you remember, have any particular recollections about uh, crises that we encountered with failed equipment and successes at making it work again? Uh, not, not real clearly, uh, although I, I think I recall that one of the very first places we decided to use the new 3020 uh, TSI continuous flow CPC was up on top of Zilnez Mesa, Mesa after we bounced it up there on top of the bedrock for I don't know how many miles. Uh, so uh, I, th this, this, the, the field work certainly, th this was where I learned to deal with the, the instrumentation. Because you're right, it, it took quite a beating in, in this bread truck we drew, drove around it with it. Uh, I know we had a, a very ancient tape-based data acquisition system, uh, and it was decided that uh, we wanted to update that, and so we we started. Uh, I, I somehow ended up with that project, and we used the 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 new Maxim. It was called uh, with a whole bunch of, I don't even remember how we programmed it, but it required redoing all the interface boards, which was just a, a huge amount of work. And uh, it, it was kind of a lot of pressure because this is where all our data was going to go and was this thing going to work? <laughs> and Maxim, by the way, had nothing to do with Macintosh computers. Correct. Yeah, it was, it was a, a product which lasted for a while, was very helpful for, to us at the time, but became obsolete eventually. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, eventually it became time to work on your thesis, and um, we talked about it. Uh, Ken Whitby died um, during your period as a graduate student, and you began to work with me uh, as your primary advisor. and. Um, and we talked about thesis projects, and at around that time, I decided that a that a worthwhile goal was to develop instrumentation for measuring particles smaller than 10 nanometers. It was really a measurement frontier. We didn't know if they'd be important or not, but we knew that we didn't understand um, much at all about particles in that size range. We had no way to measure them, and so together we decided that you would work on the uh, design of a condensation particle counter that would provide more accurate data for particles smaller than 10 nanometers. Now, this was not work done in a vacuum. Then uh, Lou had done some very nice work, pioneering work, on size-dependent counting efficiencies of many types of CPCs, including the old expansion instruments, including the Pollock instrument. We have one on display downstairs today. Uh, and as well as the new 3020 CPC, the continuous flow instrument, which was commercialized in 1980. And, um, and so we decided to see if we could um, advance the technology to improve the counting efficiencies for the smallest particles that we could detect. Um, talk a little bit about the design concept, the thinking that we went through to come up with our Final design. What do you recall? Well, um, first of all, we have to realize that uh, pr prior to the 3020, uh, we, these were all these pulsating expansion type CPCs, which uh, were just not conducive to. Uh, certainly, you could not set up a, an SMPS type system with this pulsating flow. Uh, and, and so it, it was quite amazing that somebody had come up with the idea, the concept of how to do this continuous flow. So it, it was a first cut instrument. And uh, as wonderful as it was, uh, just being the first cut, there was lots of room for improvement. And uh, in particular, uh, it, it seems to me up until then, all we had were kind of one-dimensional models of how these worked. Uh, so that 
you know, we, we'd have the warm saturator, it would start cooling in the condenser, uh, but it was only done one dimensionally. And uh, we could uh, probably tell by various means. Well, for instance, uh, the 3020, when it was characterized its counting efficiency, it uh, has a very gradual cutoff in the uh, county efficiency versus diameter. And, and that's not something you're going to see out of a one-dimensional model. So it, it certainly seemed reasonable that uh, we, if we wanted to improve this, we were going to need a much better model. And uh, it wasn't long before that that I had taken this uh, heat conduction course from Ephraim Sparrow. And uh, of course, one of the, the more basic things in that is uh, the Gretz solution to heat transfer in tube flow, round tube flow. And, and along the way, uh, somewhere, if it was part of that course or whatever, that it was drawn to my attention this, this clear parallel between the various transfer processes, mass transfer, heat transfer, momentum transfer, uh, the GRET solution was good for all of these in, in a, a, a fully developed tube flow situation. And uh, so I, I think I saw fairly quickly that I could do a uh, essentially a theoretical model, non-numerical, uh, that would, should do a pretty good job of modeling uh, the, the critical part, which is what's going on in the condenser, where the supersaturation is created. And, and the biggest thing that came out of that was that the highest supersaturations are on, are, occur along the center line. A, and the immediate realization was then that uh, it, if you think about it, Peter, th this cutoff efficiency curve, you, you can move it to the left or right on the diameter scale depending on your temperature difference between the saturator and the condenser. But uh, one of the key things with condensation particle counters is that uh, you have to make sure you don't homogeneously nucleate particles from nothing. Uh, and, and these, it, so if, if we get uh, the supersaturation too high in any spot of that condenser, then we can get homogeneous nucleation and, uh, and then it it's really doesn't work so well anymore. So <clears throat> if we have this gentle cutoff, okay, we up the temperature difference, we push it over to the left, the smaller and smaller diameters. But eventually, those smallest particles, uh, wherever those are nucleating, those are the ones, that same place is where we're going to start getting homogeneous nucleation. So now, that, that limits how far we can go. And we're left with this very tapering cutoff. So the theory tells us, well, what we should be doing is trying to put all the particles where the highest supersaturation is, down the center line. And, and that pretty much then, and, and then that, that would mean we should get a much steeper cutoff. Uh, so uh, that directly led to the idea of sheathing the flow. Uh, so um, you talked about your theoretical Gretz solution analysis. About the same time you were taking this course from Eve Sparrow, you were also taking a numerical computa co computational heat and mass transfer course from Suhaus Patanker, uh, where he taught you about the simple method that he had developed, and um, which is historically also a very important methodology. Why did you choose not to use a numerical approach? What are the pros and cons? What could you have done, perhaps, with the numerical approach that you could not do with the theoretical approach, and vice versa? I think probably uh, it was really more uh, a bias on my part uh, against 
numerical solutions if I could do a theoretical one. Mm -hmm. it, it comes out of my, my physics background and, and my idea of uh, wanting sort of like the perfect solution. Uh, so it, it and I, I think, you know, the numerical solutions uh, were, were not that prevalent at that time. I mean, nowadays you have these packages and you just plug it in and hit the on switch, go switch, and there you go. You got your solution. Uh, so, um, to, to me, with, with the mathematical background and everything, th this, it, I took so much more to the theoretical series solution of Gretz than, than this sort of crude uh, numerical stuff. And, uh, of course, there's advantages to both. The, the series solution, uh, the, the more, the closer you get to the inlet of the condenser, wherever the, the temperature change is, uh, the more terms you need in your series to get an accurate solution. Uh, also, but you also have uh, at the edges, since they're so close to the wall where you have this essentially step change in the temperature, um, th this is, things are going to happen really, really fast there. And you could, on a numerical solution, I guess, really load up the grid there, make it quite fine. But uh, in some sense, the you know, that's not necessary uh, after you get just a little ways in, in from the entrance, then a numerical solution with, with a reasonable finite number of terms can give you a very accurate solution. Now, in, in thermal science um, discipline, um, a very careful dimensional analysis is normally a part of an analysis of any problem. And, of course, that was also a part of your analysis of this problem. Um, can you comment on the importance of doing dimensional analysis? I bring this up because I think very frequently, now that we have numerical methods, people tend to solve particular cases rather than the more general case that can be solved That's through true. dimensional analysis. Well, certainly in using the, the Gretz solution is essentially in a dimensionless form. Uh, I suppose not strictly, but uh, the 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 part where you're putting in the diffusivity, you have to put it in in terms of a uh, a non-dimensional form. And since I was going to use the same numbers, the same coefficients for my series solution for multiple different profiles, I was calculating. Uh, I naturally had to put those in non-dimensional form so that they could use those coefficients the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, out of the uh, the dimensional, the understanding of the non-dimensionalization and whatnot, uh, I, I gradually gained a much better understanding of sort of how this process was all coming about in a, in a sort of hand-waving sense in the condenser. If, if you think about it, uh, th this, this warm, uh, humid, maybe it's humid with uh, butanol, uh, enters this cold condenser. And <clears throat> the butanol wants to condense on the walls, but it, it's got a certain diffusion rate to get there. And the heat wants to go to the walls, and that's got a race to get there. And uh, it becomes a race. Uh, which, which process is going to be faster? If you have the heat transfer faster, then that's great. You can create a very high supersaturation uh, because you, you suck out that heat. You've lost almost none of the vapor, and, and that's that gives you that high supersaturation. But then uh, later when we came to the water, uh, this, uh, I had explained all this to Suzanne Herring, 
And, and she put it together later that uh, by this hand wave, well, sure, now, now the, the race is different because the water can actually move faster than the air molecules. And uh, so th this uh, differential is reversed. So somehow <clears throat> uh, we have to reverse the way we're driving it to make it work. And, and that came, got us to the point of having a cool saturator and a warm condenser. I think the insight of going from um, a laminar flow heavy molecule, CPC, such as butanol, to a laminar flow light condensing vapor, CPC, such as water, was a beautiful insight and reflects the value of really having a very clear fundamental understanding of the physics behind the design and function of an instrument. So eventually you had to um, come up with a physical realization of, of an instrument. Your mathematics gave you an idea as to how this could work, but you actually had to build something that would work. What were some of the challenges that you encountered in actually making a, a real physical instrument? Well, I, I don't know uh, if I'm remembering this quite right, but I, I think first I, I brought that solution to you and noted what needed to be done. And you let me know that, lo and behold, Chuck Wilson in our lab had already built a sheath CPC. Uh, in his case, he was doing it for response reasons uh, because he was flying his CPC on a spy plane up in the stratosphere and he needed to have split-second response on that thing. By the way, not for the purpose of spying. <laughs> no. <laughs> but for the purpose of measuring Hey, I, that, I didn't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> particles that influence uh, stratospheric ozone uh, right. concentrations. Anyway. <laughs> so um, that, <clears throat> that let me know from the start that th this was eminently doable. Uh, and... I, I was very, very lucky because at, at some point in this process, TSI was gracious enough to donate a 3020 for me to start modifying, butchering as I saw fit. <laughs> and a version of that instrument is on display downstairs today. That's, that's correct. <laughs> we continue to <clears throat> modify that, that same instrument. And um, uh, I, I don't know how much... Uh, People remember about this instrument, but it, it essentially had a, a more or less horizontal saturator, a corner block here that simply was that, a corner for the flow to go around, and a vertical condenser. And this, um, I, I, I didn't think outside this design very far, so, so my idea simply was to uh, play with that corner block. That was going to be where I introduced the aerosol. And, um, <clears throat> but it, it was, um, I, I <clears throat> have a vague memory, and, and I, I, I don't know if this was before getting the 3020 or exactly what, but I, I played with all kinds of designs trying to figure out how do I get that aerosol on the center line while this flow is coming through and I, I don't mess up the flow. Um, <clears throat> and uh, besides the 3020, TSI ended up allowing me to work with Burl Dendler, who was <clears throat> one of their machinists, and uh, his specialty, I'm not sure if he did other things, but he had uh, a very, very small lathe. I think it might have been driven by a Dremel tool. <laughs> and <clears throat> so he was very, very good at uh, machining quite small parts. And so with, with uh, I think his guidance of what could and couldn't be done, I, I had some realization that my idea of having a hook that somehow came through a wall 
came around a corner and then had a, a, a knife edge end here, injecting the aerosol was going to be really tough to make. <laughs> it's always good to talk to a machinist. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I think even before I talked to him, I had an idea that this was not going to fly easily. And of course, he verified that. But I, I think he let me know that uh, indeed I, I could have these pretty easily have these nested tubes that essentially, um, the, uh, uh, of course, besides the activation of these particles with high enough supersaturation, if we wanted to measure five or whatever nanometer particles down there, we had to worry about the fusion losses. And uh, so I had to get it to that injection point, and I had to do it without losing half of them or 80% or whatever. Uh, so... Uh, part of this was coming up with this sampling of core flows at actually two different points in the inlet, inlet system so that I, I could, uh, I might lose 50% of the particles getting from here to here, but then I sample off the center line uh, of the flow I actually want, and that may have only lost 5%. Uh, so... Um, that uh, we, we came up with this final design and, and then Verl was so good because he made all these critical parts and uh, it, it was just a matter of more or less changing out this corner block and putting that in. Uh, I, I think th th there was a fair amount of effort and design work in all of this. But then came the challenge of, did this all work? And the very first thing I did was to try to set up some flow visualization experiment. And uh, so I managed to find a, a tube, a glass tube, essentially the same size as the condenser and replace the condenser with that. Uh, and then uh, get a very high concentration aerosol coming into the CPC so that uh, with a bright light, I could see the aerosol coming up in this uh, sort of jet from the capillary where the aerosol gets injected. And I got some very nice pictures. And it was sort of like, ah, it all works. Because after that was the real challenge of the measurements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that that those were some very, very long hours uh, getting those measurements because... Uh, the measurements of detection efficiency versus size. Right, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, had, um, we had had this uh, CPC workshop in 1984 where we had attempted to uh, measure some of the efficiencies of the various CPCs that people were working on at the time uh, to measure down that far. And out of that, uh, uh, a student named Bartz had built uh, an, uh, an ultra-fine aerosol generator that essentially used an oven and a tube through through the furnace. In this case, we had atomized aerosol that was going in as opposed to a boat. This thing, he, he had, uh, the idea was to be able to quench the flow coming out of that uh, tube very, very quickly in hopes of keeping it from growing too large. And so there were some fairly uh, intricately machined parts with impinging jets right at the exit of the furnace. This would have been very hard to do in ceramics. So this was all out of high temperature steel. Turns out uh, it doesn't matter, high temperature stainless steel. Even high temperature stainless steel does not like salt. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> over the months of my uh, measurements, 
this thing was corroding away. And uh, I, I never got the same aerosol two days in a row, I don't think. Uh, and uh, the, the amount of extra material that was being added somehow from these corrosion products uh, eventually made it so I couldn't make as small a particle as I did in the, in the beginning. Fortunately, I would gotten my CPC data all done at that point. But uh, the, this, uh, the, the other major issue was, despite that I, I had minimized losses in the CPC, there were still plenty of losses elsewhere. And my standard was going to be an electrometer uh, again, for the aerosol concentration. And that needs a pretty noticeable concentration, 1,000 per cc or something uh, minimal like that. Uh, I, I couldn't always get that for the very smallest particles. I, I looked back the other day. Some of those were less than 300 per cc, and I was still getting what looked like decent data. But for the electrometer, in, the, in this situation, I had to use the charge accumulation mode. And w w this was all without data acquisition computers. I, I had strip charts of the charge accumulation. Every once in a while, there'd be a little bump from uh, an alpha decay or a cosmic ray or something or other that uh, I would have to manually subtract off from uh, the rate at which we're accumulating charge. And uh, so every measurement took, uh, I don't know, three, four minutes, something like that, uh, minimum, I think. Uh, and then everything's being recorded by hand. So um, your goal was to measure detection efficiency versus size. And you pushed to lower and lower sizes than um, had been done previously, I think. And eventually, uh, you also had been studying uh, the Knutson and Whitby 1975 during Verisol Science paper on the transfer function of DMAs. In their analysis, they consider um, deterministic transport without the possibility of diffusion. And you recognize that particles would diffuse away from the uh, non-diffusing transport line. And that this would lead also some particles that would not normally have been collected would diffuse in and be sampled. And together, these effects would lower and broaden the transfer function, thereby degrading the quality of your counting efficiency data. So talk about how all of this figured into your thinking um, uh, in the thesis that you eventually wrote. Uh, fr frankly, it would be nice if I, if I could remember more about what, how I got started on my thinking about the DMA. Uh, but the, uh, some, somehow I, I wonder if there were some measurements or something that uh, verified this. <laughs> We're, had we done some TDMA experiments, maybe, that might have demonstrated that? can't remember. Yeah. yeah. A anyway, um, <clears throat> so the, uh, I I if you think about back to, I, I was trying to make this CPC with the, the sheath, uh, sheathing of the aerosol flow. To get a cutoff, uh, versus diameter that was quite sharp. Well, if you're going to measure a sharp cutoff like that, uh, we, we like to think of the aerosol as being monodispersed coming out of the DMA. But now with this diffusional broadening, we, we got a distribution this wide trying to measure a cutoff like this. Uh, it, it's not just at that one peak point anymore. And uh, so, if I was going to uh, 
uh, first of all, properly characterize that cutoff efficiency, I was going to have to know ex exactly what was happening to that transfer function. How wide was it getting? And uh, I, I think later, at some point, I realized that for the most part, uh, in, in things like measuring an ambient size distribution, that broadening doesn't have a whole lot of effect. But you're not looking at these steep characteristics uh, like you are on a CPC county efficiency curve. So um, th this, uh, so <clears throat> uh, previously, uh, with I, as I was saying, we we always saw this as a monodisperse aerosol. That is, it, it's a single size coming out of the DMA, and we will treat it as such. Well, now, uh, this wasn't. Uh, I couldn't do that anymore. And, and so, uh, instead of a nice, simple equation is we fed it this concentration at this size to this instrument, and, uh, you know, our electrometer said it was this concentration, and the CPC said it was that, and all we do is take the ratio. Now I ended up with integrals. We fed it this distribution. We have a cutoff efficiency that's varying over that distribution, and, and so the average concentrate uh, seen was this much. And uh, to back out that cutoff, meant uh, somehow uh, ba backing out through this integral. A and I, again, it was pretty easy to set down the equations. But ultimately, I, I needed to uh, fit my model to the data. And uh, that required a search routines and calculations of these integrals on, I used a, a, a personal computer. They had just come out. And uh, so my poor, luggable Zenith laptop uh, was uh, pounding away for sometimes two days at a time trying solutions over and over where it has to recalculate all these integrals and say, does it fit, does it fit? And I don't know how many times I had to run, maybe for several hours, only to found, find out I still didn't have all the bugs out of the program, and fix it something and start again. And, and so uh, by the time it was finally running, I, I was sort of on pins and needles for two days. Oh, please, no power failures, no nothing. Finish so it can write out the data. <laughs> I, I think your thesis by many is, is regarded as a really a, a beautiful piece of work. It, it, it includes the design of the nano CP or ultrafine CPC. Uh, it includes a very careful experimental evaluation of the size-dependent county of efficiency, which required, in turn, that you understand the diffusion function of the DMA and then develop a theoretical approach for accounting for the effects of diffusion on the measured efficiencies. And um, it was a lot of hard work to put that together, and, and beautiful and deep thinking. And in the end, uh, we finally wrote one paper in 1991, which was on the new um, ultrafine CPC and its function, and referred to your thesis for the diffusion work, but we really didn't ever publish the details of that work. Nevertheless, your thesis has been widely disseminated. Many people have used it to understand the diffusion uh, transfer, and we eventually in 2008 wrote a very abbreviated dis uh, description of the results from the analysis, but never all of the details about how you got there. Uh, well, we should probably go on and talk about later parts of your career. Sure. You continued mm -hmm. on with aerosol instrumentation development. Uh, <clears throat> you did a postdoc with Chuck Wilson at Denver University for a couple of years. 
and then you went on to work with Suzanne Herring at uh, her new company, Aerosol Dynamics Incorporated. And what was your initial work with ADI? Well, <laughs> Su Su Suzanne had brought me on board with, with uh, very high recommendations from both Chuck and Peter, I think. And uh, I, I had worked with her some on some previous field trips. She had had uh, her company it, sort of running out of her garage, uh, but there, there was no real laboratory. And uh, it, it was quite exciting as she called on me to help her create a, a real laboratory. And of course, the first thing we had to do was, was uh, find a location and, and then start outfitting the basic things we need, you know, compressed air pipes and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but <clears throat> that, that all went apace. And... Uh, one of our earlier projects, uh, you know, Suzanne came with money to, to do this infrastructure work, but we didn't have a lot of money to just go out and buy aerosol instruments. Uh, so one, one of the, early on, we uh, had a project where we were going to uh, use a DMA to calibrate uh, uh, an optical particle counter on ambient aerosols as opposed to having a PSL calibration or something like that. Be because, uh, for instance, Minnesota at the time was uh, typically out there uh, running uh, some something, uh, uh, let's see, were we getting SMPSs by then? Maybe something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. but but then, uh, so th this this was maybe up to a few tenths of a micron. But then above that, they were using an optical particle counter, and there was always this problem of. How do you match up these two? Because one's an optical size and one's a mobility size. And uh, so our idea was hopefully we could uh, calibrate that OPC directly there in the field with mobility size particles from a DMA. And, um, but to do that, you know, the OPC is going up to one micron and more, and uh, this, the standard uh, TSI DMA w would have had to use like a, a one or two liter per minute sheath flow, meaning the aerosol would have been, flow would have been tiny. So we, we needed to construct a DMA that could process a fairly high volume of flow and still give us one or one micron particles. Uh, so I, I created this, designed this DMA that was about yay big around and this tall, uh, kind of going back in the direction of the Whitby aerosol analyzer a little, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but, but this thing had a, about seven times the aerosol processing capacity as, as the standard TSI long. So at, at one uh, micron, I, I could have, uh, I think I, I could have 15 liter per minute sheath flow and still get out one micron particles with a, say, one and a half liter per minute aerosol flow, which is what our OPC wanted. Uh, so at, at this point now, we were, we were getting better with... Uh, it, it, it was a little more standard to automate systems with computer control and stuff like that. So uh, we set up a system that would, uh, uh, once we had that DMA in the field, it, it would automatically go through the calibration steps and then switch some valves around and take measure a size distribution with that OPC as well as the DMA uh, doing its thing for the, the smaller particles. <clears throat> it turns out 
uh, that that particular configuration, the, though it, it worked nicely for that field study, we, we never really used it again. We did, however, use that DMA for everything after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that design uh, was actually picked up by Don Collins' letter with a few modifications to make uh, a number of his own instruments. And I think a few others actually got instruments made of the same design. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, eventually you came back to Minnesota and we continued to work together on developing yet better nano CPCs. Uh, Ken Ida, you, you were an important contributor to Ken's work and um, we've continued to work on that since Ken has left. It's been uh, tremendously gratifying work, I think very significant contributions. <clears throat> what would you say are the most satisfying um, contributions personally satisfying contributions? I, I don't know so much that it's a particular thing I did. Just the, the idea that uh, I, I put in so much work into my thesis. I, you know, I, I've been living with this perfectionism most of my life. And uh, uh, for a lot of things, it, it's not the best trait to have, let me tell you. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it, it was very good. It, it's been great to, to see that my insistence and persistence at getting things right uh, in the first go. And, and uh, this, this is, you know, it, if this product's going to have my name on it, darn it, it's going to be right because I don't want somebody two weeks from now saying, oh, yeah, but you could have done this. And. Uh, to find out that these action, you know, what I have produced has lasted over the years and has had continued impact and contribution to the aerosol community, that, that's where my satisfaction comes from. Great. It's a good place to end up. Thank you, Pete. It's been nice talking to you today. <laughs>